it was the early 1980s, and this poster hung in the computer room, i.e. the basement of my buddy Dave's house. The poster belonged to a sister, Renee, who had actually seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, something I would have to wait for until it showed up on cable a little later. That said, I did know of the film's star. As Han Solo, actor Harrison Ford had thrilled fans in Star Wars and its sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, so it wasn't hard to imagine the actor in another lead role. Inspired by Hollywood serials of the 1940s, the character of Indiana Jones was a globe-trotting treasure hunter with a taste for adventure and a wisecrack for every occasion. Sporting his trusty fedora and kangaroo leather bullwhip, Indy exploded into the public eye, beginning a series of cinematic adventures that continue to this day. Cincinnati-based toy company Kenner, after having made a mint off the aforementioned Star Wars property, decided that Indy had the right stuff for his own line of three and three-quarter inch action figures. Let's take a look at what they came up with and whether the line would see Kenner catch lightning in a bottle for a second time. The first series of toys consisted of four figures and two playsets. We begin with Indiana Jones, naturally, sporting the standard leather jacket and hat. While arguably a generic pump hero design, decades old, the look became instantly identifiable with Indy and the character has rarely strayed from it. He comes with a tiny pistol, which was probably instantly lost, although somehow this specimen managed to hang on to his. Not so the whip, so we solved the problem the way any self-respecting kid would, with whatever they could find lying around the house. This piece of plastic covered wire works, but reproduction whips are inexpensive and easily sourced, if you want your figure to look nice. Next up is the sinister Nazi villain Toad sporting the mandated black leather trench coat associated with fascist baddies of the time. Here the coat is a pliable rubber, allowing it to rest over the figure's shoulders. Now, in spite of being evil, Tote's manners are exceptional in that he greets everyone warmly. Hiya, fellas! Hiya, Marion! This also allows Tote to show the scar he received in a grabby moment in the film's first act better put some hydrocortisone on that pal. He comes with a Luger pistol for when people don't wave back. Feisty bar owner and love interest Marion Ravenwood was the third figure in the line. Instead of the collared shirt and dungarees she's introduced in, Kenner opted to release Marion in a lacy dress that she wears later in the film. Female figures could be a hard sell at retail, so perhaps the company was trying to play up the resemblance to a certain other popular Lucasfilm heroine who sported all white. She comes with a plastic figure stand and something we are told is a monkey. Ugh. It's like it's looking into my soul. The first series concludes with another notable rogue, the Cairo Swordsman. The figure sports a black cloth tunic with a red fabric sash tied around its waist. As in Kenner's concurrent superpowers line, some of the indie figures have an action feature. In the swordsman's case, he swings his deadly scimitar, a fun feature but, as the film eloquently illustrates, pretty ineffective against a well-placed shot. Series 2 followed a year later, adding an additional five figures, along with offering the original four. And while it in itself was great, it did create a problem, throwing off case pack ratios. After all, Indy was the line's must-have, leading to a shortage of the hero on the pegs. And with no hero to buy, many consumers left the rest of the figures to gather dust. That said, let's see what we did get. Indy's Paul Sala is next. Like the Cairo Swordsman, this figure gets an authentic cloth robe tied at the waist. He also comes with a torch to help lead his pal to the Ark of the Covenant. While the sculpt features a pleasing likeness, you can begin to see the problem here. Outside of adventures with Indiana, few kids are going to have a use for this toy, benevolent smile notwithstanding. Perhaps cognizant of the lack of their lead hero on the pegs, Kenner offered a variation of Indy as Nazi soldier. 
as the old adage goes, no man can serve two masters, leading to the failure of this particular offering. Fans of the character had little interest in Indy sporting a monochromatic uniform he wore for all of five minutes, while the figure's distinctive five o'clock shadow made it inappropriate for general army building. He comes with the bazooka. Next up, it's German Mechanic. While I'm certain if I were to dig deep into Raider's lore, I'd find out this guy had a name and backstory and everything. In reality, he's just another shiny body to knock down. Yeah, he comes with a wrench, but this glistening sheen is the character's true strength, allowing both opponents and cinematic direction to slip off with little effect. The figure captures this man gloss perfectly. Big points for detail, but making the shirtless baddie oily may be a bridge too far for some. Here's the film's main villain, the infamous Rene Belloc. Although he looks less like a heavy and more like a bartender at a tropical resort, I'll have a Cuban breeze and keep him coming. People talk about how no one wanted an Obi-Wan Kenobi, but that figure is action-packed compared to this cat who comes with a paper map. Yeah. Try harder, Kenner. And they did offering Belloc again in ceremonial robes as seen at the end of the film. And while there is certainly more visual appeal to this design, it's still the same garden variety Euro villain in the end. Kenner most likely realized that this figure would stall at retail, making him a mail order offer, increasing the toy's cachet to a slight degree. Still boring though. The map room playset gave your figures something to do although it was too small to host more than one or two players. This sort of scrimping didn't help the line, adding a general sense of cheapness to the proceedings. Oh sure, all the bits were nice, but in the end, this was a small plastic tray with accessories that ideally would have been packaged with the figures in the first place. That said, Kenner did include one more item, a robed version of Indy, to make the action scene accurate. This and the Staff of Ra are the best aspects of this playset, combining to make a compact but attractive display for one shelf. The Streets of Cairo gives you more stuff, in the form of a wheelbarrow, some baskets, and a mess of plastic vegetables. Not only that, but the set also includes a repurposed Cairo Swordsman, plus a Marion figure that you could either hide in one of the aforementioned baskets or slip into a nativity scene to see if anyone notices. No, oh, and there's another monkey. Sneak that in there as well. Following on is the Desert Convoy Truck, another fairly uninspiring item. It's not a bad toy per se, but in the end, it's really just something for Indy to be dragged behind. Outside of reenacting scenes from the film, offerings like this simply don't provide kids many thrills. Kenner would have done better to issue a tank or bomber if they wanted to go the historic vehicle route. Film accurate or not, they would have at least been fun. Well, that was a horsey, too. We finish out with the Well of Souls, an actual playset, and the highlight of the line. I wish I had more pictures to share with you, but, well, that wasn't in the lot, so we have to make do. It comes with a scalable wall, a mummy, and, of course, snakes. The arc is especially nice, done in that back metal paint Kenner used as his aesthetic ace in the hole, although the sculpting here makes that a bonus rather than an essential. Just don't go opening it. It's safe to say that the adventures of Indiana Jones' toy line didn't live up to anyone's expectations. Kenner aimed for a similar success to spiritual sister franchise Star Wars, while the consumer just wanted to keep the film's excitement alive. While falling short of these expectations, today the line is remembered fondly, not for what it might have been, but for what it was, a chance to have an indie of your own for whatever adventures you find yourself having. Just watch out for snakes. Alright, every now and then something worthwhile appears in the mailbox and today is that day. Yeet Presents is the official publication of Old Guys Who Like Old Comics and issue 57 really brings the heat. 
the lead story, Solace 2, is a deep space yarn shot through with grim humor and otherworldly horror. Written by our own Dennis Miller and illustrated by a cavalcade of Yeats' finest, the story features compelling characters and some truly tasty artwork. Not only that, but there's a four-pager by legendary comics creator Dandy Don Simpson, a coup for any comic, let alone a stout little indie. Publisher Mike Jones ensures that every installment of Yeet is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, so you won't want to miss a single issue. Sign up at the link below and tell them Mink sent you. As if I don't already get enough play. Obviously, we love old comics here at the network, but there's something about vintage magazines that keeps us coming back for more. Let's dig into our recent findings and see what lurks within. We start with Spaceman number two from no less than the Acker Monster himself. Forrest J. Ackerman's famous Monsters of Filmland was selling like gangbusters, so why not replicate the formula for a space-based rag? From the letters page to the ads at the back, it's the same format as its sister publication, so if you like that, well, you should enjoy this. Before the World Wide Web, magazines like these were a prime source of information and inspiration for both casual fans and up-and-coming filmmakers. There were behind-the-scenes features, informative articles, and quizzes, but for many, the best part was getting a good view at monsters seen only in passing on the silver screen. One could take the time to appreciate the skill and artistry that went into the process, dwelling on intricately sculpted masks and spacecraft given the full-page treatment. Readers also got to see concept art and matte paintings, making these less magazines and more windows into a fantastic, albeit monochromatic, universe of infinite potential. And all that for 35 cents. After that, it's Screen Thrills Illustrated, Volume 3, Issue Number 2, for those of you playing along at home. The magazine is less general than Spaceman, giving readers specific spotlights on cinematic characters like Zorro or the Lone Ranger. It's easy to forget how popular such properties were back in the day, with the characters not only appearing on the big screen, but radio, television, and the printed page to boot. Now, I wouldn't consider myself the biggest Lone Ranger fan in the world, but I've always liked the concept. It's a less complicated world, where right and wrong are as clear as day and night. And, no matter what the stakes, good always prevails. Unlike character actor George Raff here, who seems to like knocking women around, boo, looks like Robert Taylor isn't going to be as easy to intimidate. Kick his ass, Bob. Not sure how the rivalry between the Beatles and the Marx Brothers is going to shake out, however. I can see that getting contentious. I mean, it's bad enough the band stole Moe's haircut, but do things need to get ugly? Er. A lot was made of the similarities between the two acts after a hard day's night, but true fans know that there's only one Fab Four. What, you forgot Shemp? <laughs> Why, I oughta... There's more inside, including this compelling image from Goldfinger. Hey lady, my buddy Oscar wants to ask you out. It's all good fun, of course. Entertainment hadn't become the joyless hectoring nag that it is today. The focus was on providing a diversion from life, not holding a mirror to it. Film and magazines about film offered the consumer another view of their world, one colored more by imagination and invention, and less by the rancid crap that the corporate machine spews out of every orifice today. Now, bring out the gimp. Let's jump forward a decade or so to another sci-fi magazine. I don't really know much about Starburst. I just picked it up for this article about Monster, a.k.a. Monstroid, a low-budget stinker worth a Rift Tracks commentary. Then again, I'd listen to those guys read a phone book. Do they still make phone books? Ah, hell. I'm sure we can find one. Marvel threw his hat into the black-and-white magazine ring with Monster Madness. Unlike the previous publications, this features no quizzes, articles, or even a crossword puzzle to pass the time. Instead, it's full-page photos with joke captions provided by no less than Stan Lee. 
Okay, more than likely it's by a poorly paid ghostwriter, but still, that sort of thing. If you bought this without looking inside, you might feel a little ripped off, and justifiably so. Famous monsters had better pictures, and these jokes are lame, even by Stan standards. This one is for Marvel Monster Completionists only. I picked up this issue of True West simply because I like the cover. It's as nice as all. A holiday cowboy repast, what with a garnish and everything. Publications based on the Old West were once fairly popular, featuring articles with historical precedent, with thrilling titles like The Duke of Death Valley, or How Cherokee Bill Shot Me. Or how about this lady and her dog, outwitting Pancho Vila? I bet it was a boned-based strategy, with possible belly work involved. Next, are you weak? Then learn meat cutting! Oh wait, those are two separate ads. Still, you might as well send for both, just to be safe. Then, use the rig of a champion, and never let any ornery ombre get to draw on you again. Hey, you can bet if Pike Landusky had had one, he'd be singing a different tune. Then, it's Challenge for Men, and I was surrounded by 800 nudes. Sadly, these were 1950s nudes, so they were about as exciting as suggestively draped potato sacks. But hey, don't go. There's still lots of cool stuff in here. Learn how boxing czars ruin a fighter. Discover the terror on the waterfront. Then meet Danish superstar Greta Thyssen, a bombastic beauty who is really freaking me out with all the masks. That said, she seems to be having a good time, so why kill her buzz? These ads for hypnosis were always dodgy. Guys like this are the last ones we need to be giving uncanny powers to. Best to sublimate those urges with an order from the Bizarre Book Service. Ha! Ah, so this is what P.O. boxes were for. Then, airlines want young men. Yeah, they do. Do you like gladiator movies, Johnny? If being a pilot doesn't work out for you, you can always get into airline engine repair. Oh sure, you don't get a hat or a snappy uniform or respect, but uh, you do get, um, I don't know, the coveralls bring out the green in your eyes? Then kiss and cry no more. All the answers you need in plain men and women talk. Every detail picture clear. Well, okay. If there are pictures. That said, you may need more than pictures. Try these weird vitamins. They're sure to fix you right up. Nah, who are we kidding? This guy is too busy being Jack Benny to care. Then, have you met Meg Miles? She's the girl with the big, big, big dimensions. Although she doesn't really seem to be all that into it. From her expression, the photographer ran over someone's pet moments before snapping the photo. Gee, I think it's still alive. Don't worry about it, baby. Show them dimensions. <clears throat> you can be forgiven for thinking that Whizbang is a Fawcett comic, as my boss and I both thought the same thing. It's either a bit of cheek or sheer coincidence, as Captain Marvel and his extended family are nowhere to be seen in this collection of gently bawdy one-panel gags. It was published by Country Press way back in 1940 for a hefty 25 cents. I don't recognize any of the artist's names, but hey, I'm far from an expert in such things. However, I do know what I like, and this book is great fun. As the saying goes, old guys like a drink and a smoke and a wink and a joke, so this makes a great addition to my cocktail napkin humor collection. Mad Magazine was a phenomena back in its day, and, like all phenomena, it spawned imitators. Lunaticle is one such simulacrum, featuring work from no less than Joe Kubert, Lee Elias, and Russ Heath, among others. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the Smotley crew was helmed by one Myron Fass, who'd never met an idea that he couldn't exploit. Now, if you don't know who Fass is, be sure and check out our Eerie Pubs video at the link below to get the whole See Me story. With ad parodies, movie and TV spoofs, and oddball photography, there wasn't much Mad did that Lunaticle didn't attempt to ape. 
with mixed results. Obviously, jokes in a 60-year-old magazine are going to lose a little something freshness-wise, but it's not a stretch to say that this feels like a knockoff, in the way that store brand soda seems similar to the real deal, only it has that weird aftertaste and goes flat almost immediately. For all that, it is a pleasure to look at being tonally on point with the times while offering a slightly more acerbic flavor than your average Bill Gaines offering. If you dig humor mags or just want something to set on the coffee table to alienate guests, then Lunatickle may be the magazine for you. Thank you for joining us. Old Guys t-shirts are back. Come and take a look at the great new colors and designs. Remember, every purchase goes to help us keep the channel going. So, not only will you look fantastic, but you'll keep videos like this coming. I'm Jason Mink, and until the next time, cheers.